Hello, I'm Connie Casri. I'm a professor of human development and psychology at UCLA. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about joint attention and joint engagement, particularly for children with autism. So as most of you know, the early core challenge for children with autism is around social communication. In fact, this is the way in which children are diagnosed uh, with autism. So what does that mean? So social communication usually refers to these early, early developmental skills that happen before children actually learn to speak with words. Um, so joint attention gestures and joint engagement, and we're gonna talk specifically about those. Um, and these um, kinds of social communication skills really support the development of language. And while language is not a core deficit of autism anymore, nearly all children with autism are entering um, in the early years with language delays or language differences. So all children begin to gesture and vocalize before they learn to um, say words. And these gestures are typically used with intentionality and for different functions. Now the function may be for requesting or for sharing, and sharing refers to a joint attention gesture. So even when the form is the same, for example, a point, um, a child may point to the cookies in the cupboard and they're requesting the cookies. That's what they want. Whereas if they're in the park and they see an airplane flying overhead, maybe they point to the airplane, they look back to their mother, they look back to the airplane as if to say, wow, do you see what I see? And that's a sharing gesture. So the, the form is the same, it's a point, but the function is different. Now requesting is easier than joint attention for children with autism. And it's important that, that children learn to request. But joint attention is most important in predicting language outcomes in autism. So let's um, look at a couple of videos just to see what we're talking about. So this, um, both of these little boys are 18 months old. And the first one I'm going to show you is in the in an assessment that we do at UCLA called the Early Social Communication Scales. And the child is with an assessor that he doesn't know. So let's watch. Charlie, Charlie! It's a cow! Monkey! It's a monkey! Oh, and parrot? Right, so this little guy is um, developing typically, and he's pretty exuberant, right? He has a lot of gestures that he's using to communicate. He's actually trying to say words and he's directing the attention of the assessor. He's also following um, her attention. The next little guy with the same assessor, somebody he doesn't know, um, is in the same assessment. <laughs> Great, Rose, I got you. <gasps> Cooper, Cooper, it's a pig. I know, you see all those toys. Cooper, Cooper, it's a shark. Good, you, good, you, got you. So this little guy did get diagnosed with autism and you can see that it's more difficult for the assessor to try to engage him um, in terms of attention or for the little guy to also communicate with her. And so this is very typical of what we see. <clears throat> but it's important to teach social communication um, in early interventions. So when children are young and in that learning phase of development, um, uh, you know, for language, then we can fill in those gaps in development. 
And because these early intentional gestures support the development of spoken language, they're really critical targets. We know that children with autism who are speaking in phrases or sentences by kindergarten have the best social outcomes. And these data have been uh, persistent uh, for over three decades. So let's start with some definitions. So requesting gestures. So to request is to communicate a want or need or to direct the behavior of others with eye contact or reaching or pointing or giving. Now children will use words to request too. I want is a typical one. Um, but before that, they're gonna use these gestures. So let's look at some examples of what I'm talking about. So a child might reach to request, as in this example. Oh, here you go. Cool idea. So in that case, she is reaching with eye contact. Um, in this example, the child is giving to request. <laughs> Go on top! <gasps> Ready? And actually, the child is reaching, looking, and vocalizing with words. Um, and this little guy is pointing, so he's um, making a request of the block. Block! Go on. And because the uh, teacher is holding the block, um, out in front of the child, that is a response, not an initiation. Okay, so joint attention is different from requesting. It is to share or maintain a social interaction, either through pointing, giving, showing, or coordinated joint looks. And so here are some examples of those joint attention gestures. So here's a little girl who is just looking between the object and the um, tester or the therapist. Wow, that's so exciting. So those are very quick little looks and the therapist is responding to that um, gesture. Um, here's a give to share. Thank you. Pair on an orange plate. Right, so it's clearly a sharing um, gesture and not one for asking for help. Um, here's a, a show gesture to share. And this one, um, so shows occur in typical development around nine months. They're very early gestures. And with this little girl, she's playing for a little while before she actually spontaneously gives a share. more. Ice cream. On. More. Here, let's put it on top. Blue ice cream. Ice cream. Chocolate ice cream. <gasps> Vanilla. And there was that show. So a lot of also sharing looks in that example. And here's um, the same little girl. And now she's pointing to share something. You see purple hippo. So in typical development, all of these gestures are developing within the first um, year and a half to two years of life. So a lot of times when we see our children with autism, they're already beyond that developmental uh, age chronologically. 
So children with autism tend to demonstrate less joint attention than other children. And this is based on lots and lots of research studies comparing uh, lots of groups of different kinds of children based on both developmental age or even language age. And we know that joint attention is an important skill because it is related to language development. So children with autism who have more joint attention gestures actually have more language skills. And if they show joint attention gestures, it can predict also to better language later. So these are really important skills in early intervention. And as I said, requesting is not joint attention. Joint attention is more difficult for children with autism, and it's also more difficult to teach. So how do we teach social communication gestures? So we need to think about the context for children to learn to gesture. Children are more likely to gesture if they're engaged around a topic of conversation. And that topic can be many different things, but it's generally an activity that has props or objects and people. So it combines um, those you know, three things, the person, the object, and another person. And joint engagement sets the stage for teaching gestures. So joint engagement is the foundation for learning and it is different from joint attention, but it's often confused. So let's unpack engagement. So what is it? So it is a state or duration of connecting to objects, people, or both. And why is that important? People learn if they're actively connected and attending to their environment. We also know from a lot of research on the uh, typical development of language learning that supported joint engagement is connected to language learning. So in other words, um, parents or caregivers are the ones who are kind of organizing the engagement for the child and they lead them along in their development of language. But joint engagement can be confused with compliance. So you can be task oriented, task engaged, and that's not the same thing as joint engagement. So joint engagement involves active participation of the child and usually the adult as well. Um, and then whereas joint attention is kind of a shorthand term for those gestures that we talked about. They can be discrete gestures um, to share, and they're more likely to occur during these states of joint engagement. So let me um, give you some examples of this. So this is a little girl. She's um, 21 months of age, and she uh, was coming into a, a research study for children with autism, um, children who are at risk for autism. Um, she is with her mom with uh, a standard set of toys. So the little girl chose this toy to play with and let's watch how mom um, responds to her. So in that example, um, the mom is being very responsive to this child's choice of a toy, but the toy itself is above her developmental level. It's difficult for her to do. And so we would code this interaction as a child being object engaged, not joint engaged, um, in part because the play is too high and the child's using all of her cognitive resources just to focus in on the object. So it makes it hard for her to then also communicate with mom. 
So in intervention now, this child has, um, we've changed a few things. Mom now understands the child's play level and has a different choice of toys. So just a few days later, you'll see the mom and the baby playing. Right, so you see that ring stacker is there right next to them, but they now have a toy that's a much lower play level. And the child is able to both engage with the toy and with mom in, um, in a communicative way. So toy choice can really matter. Play level is um, important because this is the context or the conversation that the mom and the baby are having together. So when we think about engagement states, we think about this developmental progression, as well as the fact that these states can change within a single session. So sometimes children are unengaged. You know, they're thinking, they're wandering, they're, they're not engaged with toys or with people. Other times they might be on looking. So they are kind of watching the action, but they're not actually doing. Um, now in development, Babies are often person engaged or um, totally focused in on the parent's face when they're very young. So, you know, birth to six months or so. Um, but as children start to get more mobile, they sit up, they have uh, more command of their environment. They can now shift their attention to objects. So, and as they do that, as they get more interested in objects, you know, between four and six months, they become very object focused. It's hard to shift the attention between people and objects. So they early on are very person engaged, then they're very object engaged, but as they get more competent, they can shift attention between objects and people. And that's where you start to see some of the joint attention gestures and requesting gestures coming into play. But you also see this sort of supported joint engagement. The child now can stay engaged with objects and people for longer periods of time. And in the beginning, that is supported by the parent, um, but eventually the child begins to coordinate the joint, joint attention or engagement. So they actually uh, come into the engagement, they direct the action. And so um, that becomes very important. And that's a goal for our children with autism in particular. The work of Lauren Adamson on the sort of development of language suggests that between 18 months and three years, children spend the most time in supported joint engagement. So this is all to give us information about the role of the adult in helping children learn language, stay engaged, and then hopefully also learning social communication gestures and communication. So let's now look at some examples of engagement states. Um, you will recognize an unengaged state. Um, so as a teacher or a therapist, you're gonna wanna change something about this engagement. But this little guy is showing us that he's unengaged. He's actually trying to escape the um, interaction. We're staying here. not a happy camper. Um, this little guy is with his dad and the dad is being very responsive to the child. He's trying to get the child engaged in toys, but the little guy is just watching. He doesn't quite know what to do. So we would um, say that he's on looking. Austin's turn. Boston. 
So he's interested, but he's just kind of watching. Um, this little guy is person engaged because um, he's really focused in on the adult's face and not really the toys at this point. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> More? More high fives. One, two, three, four, five. Whoa. And most of our little guys that we see, um, you know, that are usually around two or older, come in and they're very object engaged. Um, so this little guy starts out object engaged and his dad is trying to change um, to get him more engaged. But again, he's he's still object engaged. Okay, what do we do here? What's that? Oh, Cookie Monster! Cookie Monster! Here, sit here, sit here, sit here, sit here. Cookie Monster. How about this? How about this? What's that? Okay, okay, push, push, push. Wow, look at that. How about this? All right, so he's mostly object engaged in that interaction. Um, so the parent could be there or not. It wouldn't matter because the object is, is gathered, is, you know, attracting all of his attention. Now, this little guy is an older guy. Um, he's about eight and he's minimally verbal. So he doesn't talk very much. He has an augmentative device there. This is in an intervention where the therapist is, is um, using supported joint engagement to keep him engaged. I want more doll. Doll. So while the child isn't looking or talking or making obvious signs of engagement, you know that he's engaged because he's taking turns. He's aware of the person. So this is the supported joint state in which most of our um, children with um, you know, minimal language skills or still language learning might be in this particular state. And then coordinated joint is where the child has much more of an idea of what she wants to do and is um, coordinating the adult. Let's watch movie. Good idea. Oh, I really want to see Frozen 2. Oh, sure. What do you want to watch? I want to watch Angry Birds 2. Oh, Angry Birds 2. That's a good one. Okay. Where's the TV? Hmm. I think... This one is the back. Great idea. This could be the TV. Oh, sure. Okay, then where's the remote control? Oh, yeah, you're right. We need the remote control. That's the couch. There's our TV. Oh, here's our remote control. Boop. And I'll turn the volume up. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> this is so funny. I love Angry Birds too. I love Angry Birds too. <laughs> this is funny. Oh. Hey, I made you some popcorn. Oh, thanks. What about my water? I'm thirsty. Oh, I'll get you some water. Hold on one second. Okay. Here you go. Mm. I love popcorn. I love popcorn and I'm full. Oh, you are okay. Don't eat any more then.
That was a great movie. Yeah, let's watch Frozen. Oh, good idea. Boo. <laughs>
kind of a natural play uh, context. And I think that that's important. You can teach these skills through direct instruction, but it's good to embed them within some kind of natural interaction. Okay, to summarize then, social communication is a core area of difficulty for children with autism. They express fewer gestures to communicate. They may be less engaged with others, but teachers or therapists can be instrumental in teaching social communication skills and really engaging children in the activities that are gonna promote communication and language. So it's really trying to keep your eye on what the goal is and using every opportunity that you have to focus in on this sort of core area of difficulty for children with autism. There are specific interventions that are available that are targeted on social communication development, specifically joint attention and joint engagement. And they've been tested in school and home settings. Um, so I would encourage you to look for those if you don't already have those in your um, setting. So thank you. And if you want more information about the interventions highlighted, you can contact us um, in the above. Thank you.